So welcome back. I'm very happy that we right after lunch start with changing representations of the invisible God and add the iconoclastic impulse of ancient philosophy. Be prepared for this message. Peter Varshud. Thank you. The notion of an ultimate reality hidden beneath a veil of deceptive imagery runs deep in the history of Western thought. And to give you an early example, let me begin with a quote from the 6th century BCE Eleatic thinker Xenophanes. I quote, one God among both gods and humans, the greatest, neither in bodily frames similar to mortals nor in thought. Of course, Xenophanes does not explicitly state that there is only one God, just that there is one God greatest among gods. However, it does seem feasible to equate greatest among in the context of other surviving fragments with dominion over multiple appearances. Before delving deeper into the implications of these verses, I should add a few saving clauses regarding the identity of Xenophanes. By referring to him as an Eleatic thinker, I have oversimplified matters by turning him into the founding member of a philosophical school and the alleged teacher of Parmenides. Yet the idea of a philosophical tribe or school uh, centered around the Italian Greek colony of Elia did not emerge with the Eleatics themselves, but with the gradual shaping of a philosophical canon in the works of Plato and Aristotle. How the pre-Platonic thinkers perceived themselves and from whence they received their intellectual input remains a matter of controversy. This is not just academic nitpicking, but a reminder of how the terminological and generic distinctions that are typically made in retrospect between spiritual trends and modalities, between revelatory poetry and philosophical tractates, between philosophers, poets and theologians, are not just means to clarify historical circumstances, but also measures of precaution. In view of such precautions, one should acknowledge that the identification of Xenophanes as a so-called pre-Socratic philosopher rather than a poet does obvious injustice to the fact that the fragments ascribed to him are all the works of a poet and of a wandering rhapsode at that. The reason for retrospectively identifying Xenophanes as more of a thinker than a poet is an outcome of favoritism, starting already with Plato's famous quarrel with poetry. According to Plato's critique of traditional poetry, thinking in images and myths is contrasted with superior forms of thinking in concepts and inferential approaches to reality. Xenophanes is made more of a thinker than a poet because he was understood by some to have polemicized against other thinking poets who by the same period reasoned differently about the attainment of knowledge. One of these, to whom I shall soon come back, was the lyric poet Simonides. Without pretending to have grasped the gist of the problem in all its complexity, I have made the comfortable choice of linking the origins and manifestations of iconoclasm in the ancient world to certain one, prevalent notions about divinity, which in their turn contradict certain two, perceived malfunctions of public worship and epic imagination. I'm not making this choice so as to presume that public worship was theologically grounded, representing in some sense the cultic manifestation of a theological argument, nor in an attempt to make distinctions between what some considered to be a Judaic religious concern with true worship and a Greek philosophical concern with true knowledge. I shall soon come back to this, th these distinctions, the one called Mosaic and the other Parmenidean, and the distinctions made between them. Rather, I simply want to stress that 
speculations about divinity and the inimitable unity of being form part of a more comprehensive discourse premised on the distinction between convention and nature, opinion and truth, becoming and being, strife and love. What the history of this idea reveals, as convincingly argued by the French historian of philosophy Pierre Adou, is not so much a disagreement about the validity of the insight, but how it should best be dealt with, cared for, exploited, given cultic or artistic expression. If we accept Deutero Isaiah as the first unambiguous monotheistic statement in the Hebrew Bible, I quote, beside me there is no God, it's equally remarkable that its conventional dating coincides with that of Xenophanes' dactylic hexameters about the gods. And without suggesting any direct influences, it does not seem entirely far-fetched to treat both the Jewish prophet and the Greek sage as representatives of an age by the beginning of the Second Temple period in which public worship was being variously reinvented and challenged in an emergent spirit of cosmopolitan intellectual exchange. An iconoclastic impulse is endemic to this discourse because it urges its auditor not to confuse being with mere appearances. A major predicament of the discourse, on the other hand, is its questionable representation of idolatry itself, namely as an inherent human incapacity to distinguish cultic representations from what they actually represent. Due to the fact that the hyperbolic misrepresentation of public worship eventually came to constitute such a prominent feature of Christian anti-pagan rhetoric, it's easy to overlook the extent to which early Christian writers, such as Tertullian and Justin the Martyr, borrowed their rhetorical figures from pagan philosophers. This embarrassing indebtedness to pagan philosophy reaches a stage of almost ironic confusion in the 5th century Christian historian Sotsumen's paraphrase of a speech by Olympius, one of the pagans who sought to resist violent and iconoclastic attacks by a Christian mob in Alexandria around 391. Olympius is supposed to have consoled his fellow co-religionists by stressing that carved images are mere appearances made of perishable matter, whereas the powers that once dwelt inside them have flown to heaven. The distinction that Plato, in his rather arbitrary fashion, once made between poets and philosophers is not unlike the one that early Christians made between pagan philosophers and Christians half a millennium later. What the antagonists shared with their accusers in terms of notions about divinity would seem contrary to the accusatory claim to have mattered less than outward appearances and occasional affiliations. A similar complication attaches to Jan Asman's more recent differentiation between two once and for all decisive distinctions, the so-called mosaic distinction and the Parmedian distinction, which he considers to mark the critical divide between emergent currents of faith-oriented confessional religiosities and a knowledge-oriented science. I believe that this grandiose distinction of distinctions can be factored differently just by pointing to the comparatively minute case of Simonides, the non-philosopher. As already pointed out, Simonides was not considered worthy of being a philosopher because he did not philosophize properly. And yet, one of the quotes from him intended to ascertain this claim in Plato's Republic is taken out of context. Seeming even constrains or overpowers the truth. Since we have no clue as to the lyrical context of the fragment, it might just as well be taken at face value as a philosophical statement. 
This is precisely the privilege eventually granted a strikingly similar verse attributed to Xenophanes. Opinion extends over all, over all things. Um, so that's a distinction made between the truth known by God and opinions. Doxa, doxai, dokos in this case. I note in passing that the verb dokio, with its noun <coughs> dokos, dokesis, either opinion, fancy, or apparition, phantom, is also seen in the word doxa, signifying appearance, both in the sense of a conjecture or an opinion, and in the sense of glory and splendor, not least that of God's celestial splendor in the New Testament. And this is a significant ambigu ambiguity since it points to the inflected means by which visual appearances and overtly irrational propositions, myth and reality are given new meaning in Christian discourse. Coming back to Simonides and Xenophanes, what they seem uh, to imply by thus contrasting truth and appearances should not be reduced to a naive negligence of truth, but rather appreciated as an acknowledgement of things as they appear in spite of what they truly are. By being just a little bit less of an extremist, Simonides is retrospectively assigned the unattractive role of a pre-philosophical poet deceived by greed and ambition in the eyes of his competitors. Needless to say, an active role in the make-believe spectacle of civic life does not exclude a philosophical outlook. We have good evidence for this in the ensuing lives of other prominent public figures, such as Cicero and Plutarch. More importantly, however, polytheistic worship and its theoretical, theological, philosophical, devotional corrective have at least one characteristic in common. They are both affirmations of a world beyond mere appearances, in that the one invites communal games of pretense and political power play, whereas the other invites antinomian practices of suspended judgment. Yet this is not where the game ends. By paving the way for an unprecedented religion of truth, vera religio, Christian theologians introduced a new option into religious life by short-circuiting two spiritual modalities that had long remained largely distinct in the ancient world. The one, call it civic and spectacular, had dominated the sphere of public worship, whereas the other, call it non-civic and speculative, had been accessible only through salvific currents of initiation and free association. While there were possibly substantial pagan precedents for this religious transformation in the context of imperial heliolatry, already a century before Constantine, it was only under the impact of imperial Christianity that the development can be said to have reached its climax. In recognizing how iconoclastic themes and tendencies were variously interwoven into the eclectic, conceptual fabric of early Christianity, we are better prepared to sort out the apparent anomaly of resurgent iconolatry in the 5th and 6th centuries, as well as its most emphatic counter-reaction in the form of an iconic Islamic worship and the Byzantine iconoclasm. Just to give this complex and fascinating topic at least some brief final attention, the conundrum, if not to say impossibility, of the icon of Christ can be conceived as the most glaring display of a compromise between those spectacular and speculative aspects of ancient religiosity. Between the affirmation of fallible appearances and the inimitable oneness of being that once tore the ancient world into incompatible fa fractions. As emphasized by the German art historian Hans Belting, the icon of Christ is neither a substitute for a once living human being, such as the fire mummy portraits produced in Roman Egypt, nor the mere visual tool for indicating a truly immaterial divine being, such as the Greek or Roman divine statues, but a visual proof of God's bodily presence on earth. 
the usual motivation for depicting things are no longer at issue. If the icon of Christ is neither under, under, understood as the visual trace of someone inevitably lost, nor the flawed imitation of an inim inimitable being, then this would seem to imply that the distinctions on which the iconoclastic impulse thrives have been largely overcome, or at least that the attempts at finding doctrinal justifications for iconolatry have been precisely about overcoming an impulse that continues to haunt the regimes of both faith and knowledge. That is, the impulse to resist the world as if it were beyond the constraints of credulity and disclosure. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> You started by saying this, the notion of an ultimate reality hidden beneath a veil of deceptive imagery runs deep in the history of Western thought. How is this visible today in philosophy and religion? Because it's, a, it's a rather tricky question, actually. Yeah. Yeah. Think it over. Mm. Welcome back. I'm, Thank you. I really want an answer to this, so yeah. I mm. promise I will haunt you. Please do. Yeah. Nathalie Lance on Judaism. Welcome up on the stage. And I start my horrible watch now. Now. Oh, okay. So the link between figural images and idolatry is clearly, f clearly formulated in the second commandment in the Decalogue in Exodus and Deuteronomy. You shall not make for yourself a sculptured image or any likeness of what is in the heavens above or in the earth below or in the waters under the earth. You shall not bow down to them or serve them. The prohibition of visual and material representations is intimately intertwined with the notions of God. Despite last century's spectacular archaeological finds of ancient Jewish visual art and continued discoveries of a flourishing Jewish pictorial culture in the Roman and Byzantine world, the popular notion of Jewish aniconism and iconophobia remains deeply rooted. Perhaps it is a shallow understanding of the meaning of Jewish monotheism that lines, lies behind this unnuanced idea of aniconism's shifting history of interpretation. Indeed, the tension between the idea of God's transcendental essence and the longing for a physical divine embodiment in the midst of the people has been a theological focal point within Judaism for millennia. A key to understand the different Jewish attitudes towards visual art is thus to unpack the concepts of both aniconism and monotheism and tangle out their interdependence. It is in the complex plurality of monotheism that we can get a glimpse of the faces of God as imagined in Jewish antiquity. Uh, Trygve Mettinger, a Hebrew Bible professor from Lund University, has been essential in challenging the previous scholarly understanding of the aniconic tradition as a unique Israelite phenomenon. Mettinger explored Israelite aniconism in the light of comparative material from the ancient Near East. With the term aniconism, Mettinger refers to cultures where there is no iconic, mainly anthropomorphic or theriomorphic representation of God as a central cult symbol and object of sacrifice or worship. Aniconic cultures have a symbol of God in the form of a lightly worked standing stone or in the form of the empty throne in the temple of Jerusalem. This kind of aniconic worship featured a tolerant, undogmatic lack of images and was a conventional practice and religious habitus in the West Semitic cultures. Metzinger called it de facto aniconism and distinguished it from the later programmatic prohibition of images that was indeed unique to Israel. 
Programmatic aniconism is a political ideology with explicit iconoclastic and iconophobic attitudes. And we can see um, the two, uh, two uh, quotes here that we have de facto aniconism in the Jacob Stone story and we have the prog programmatic ideological aniconism in uh, the quote from Deuteronomy. Uh, another important key to understanding the shifting a theology of aniconism is the heterogenic and plural composition of the various sources of the Torah and the Hebrew Bible. The texts are redacted and joined into a unity, but are stemming from different eras with different political and theological claims. Even though scholars continuously suggest different models to explain the origins and composition of the Torah, it is today common to refer to the Yahvist, Eloist source, the Deuteronomist and the priestly sources. By identifying the theological programs and historical context of these various sources, biblical scol scholars can more easily grasp the perceptions that prevailed about aniconism in relation to monotheism. The various names for God that are used may give clues to which source is behind a certain text um, and which image of God that particular source represents. The designation yud he vav he sevaot these are just a few of the divine names in the Hebrew Bible. So the, the first definition, Adonai sevaot, uh, the Lord of hosts. Um, it is a divine name that indicates a royal divine figure whose invisible presence rules from the empty throne in the first temple. According to Mettinger, this throne is an example of the empty space aniconism, a space where the god is perceived to be positioned, manifesting his invisible presence in the temple. The Tsevaot theology is aniconic, but it is anthropomorphic, as it envisions God as a king enthroned in his temple. When the first temple in Jerusalem was destroyed under the Babylonian siege in 586 BCE, the idea of the presence of God in the temple stirred up a cognitive dissonance that was handled through the introduction of new divine names reflecting other theologies. So when the place of Tsevaot, Adonai Tsevaot, when that place was in ruins, the term became obsolete. The priestly source, that is priestly literature, deals with the dissonance by introducing Kavod. And I think Kavod is greatly depicted in this uh, painting here. Kavod is, uh, it could be translated to glory or presence. The divine body is different from the human body and it is surrounded by a bright light, like an intensively burning fire. The Deuteronomist, on the other hand, often speak of Shem, that means the name of God, and resolve the dissonance by placing God in heaven, but the presence of the name in the place of worship. The name is not a manifestation of God himself, but only a sign of divine presence. God sort of owns the temple. It contains his name, not his body, which is only situated in heaven and cannot take shape through stone pillars, wooden stake, statues, or even temples. The god of the Javist Eloist source had a fluid form which could be present both in heaven and on earth and, represented, and could be represented also by pillars or stones or bull figurines. For the Deuteronomist, God had only one body situated in heaven, while the priestly writers describe God with one body situated either in heaven or on earth. So the Deuteronomic and the priestly writers strongly condemn the idea that God could be present and represented uh, by many bodies on earth in various places of worship. Although 
there is a disagreement about the dating of the various sources, many scholars place the historical ideological roots of anachronism at the origins of the Israelite religion. While the major shift towards a programmatic and ideologic um, uh, anachronism is placed shortly before the Babylonian exile, that is 587-86 BCE. Uh, this development can be understood in light of King Josiah's religious reform, which led to the centralization of the cult to the temple in Jerusalem and the strengthening of the royal mandate. He justified his campaign by saying that he and his staff had found a scroll while renovating the temple in 622 BCE. This scroll contained a divine law stipulating that one should only worship one god in one place. Many, many scholars believe that this law scroll found in the temple was actually the major part of Deuteronomy, where this idea of one, one city, one god, one temple is indeed central. In a key passage, the people are called upon to break down altars, smash stone pillars, and cut down images of gods. They should only worship the Lord in the place where he has made the dwelling place of his name, the Shem. The development towards an ideological anachronism with iconoclastic tendencies, as we can see here, it is rooted in the symbiosis between prophets who linked loyalty to the God of Israel with the condemnation of icon worship, and scribes anchored in the Deuteronomistic idea that the only medium for God's revelation is words. The word, unlike images, does not emanate, do not emanate from the material world. So by forbidding depictions and thereby greatly limiting artistic freedom, the scribes weakened the position position of artists as they strengthened their own position. So scholars debate whether the divine presence was invisible or whether there actually was an image of God in the first temple. But most believe that anachronism prevailed, at least in the most sacred zones of the first temple, the Solomonic temple. During the time of the second temple, that is 516 to, uh, BCE to 70 CE, there was a strict interpretation of the second commandment. And this we can see in texts also in Greek and in Latin. But during the three first centuries of the Roman Empire, waves of religious fervor swept through the eastern provinces where mystery religions flourished in the cultural mix that arose. During this time, figurative art flares up amongst Jews. In the magnificently decorated synagogue, uh, dating back to at least 244 CE, in the uh, Roman city of Dura Europus, located in present-day Syria, we do not see God depicted, but we see the divine hand who is uh, uh, grabbing Ezekiel, the prophet Ezekiel, by his hair and transporting him to the utopian temple. The Greco-Roman influences were so strong that in the 4th century synagogue Hamat Tiberias, the floor were decorated uh, with motifs of the sun god Helios surrounded by the zodiac. During the Byzantine Empire, religious identity became an increasingly important expression in late antique art. However, Jewish figurative art was uh, not long-lived, uh, already from the 6th century CE, before the Muslim emergence in the East. There is archaeological evidence that the Aniconic tradition returned in Jewish art. So, uh, perhaps the most central drama in Judaism is the tension between the mon monotheistic idea of God's transcendent existence beyond this world and the longing for his imminent embodiment. Sigmund Freud stressed the profound effect of the prohibition against making an image of God and calls it a triumph of intellectuality over sensuality. According to Freud, the prohibition against images elevated God to a higher degree of intellectuality, breaking the spell of sensuality. The tension between distance and intimacy to the divine articulate a theological and aesthetic trigger throughout Jewish civilizations. 
the Swedish psychoanalyst Ludvig Igra uh, described this tension as a painful source of creativity. And in this case, he speaks about the, uh, the idol worship of the golden calf. Uh, according to the Jewish tradition of thought, the gap between God and man can never be completely bridged. Creation is unconditionally separate from its creator. This entails an emotional strain that time and again drives the Jews to seek the visible and tangible forms of idolatry, to counteract the feeling of loneliness that the experience of God's absent triggers. So uh, to sum up, I hope that I have been able to convey some of the struggle with aniconic, aniconic monotheism that, uh, and that I have shown that throughout Jewish history, the divine body or lack of such has been a constant source and continues to be a constant source of theological creativity. Thank you. But why is it so dangerous to imagine God, to be able to worship God? In Judaism, sometimes you can't, you can't see God's face. You know, he mustn't be seen. You can't even mention his name. Mm. Uh, I mean, it makes it impossible for worship. <laughs> <laughs> um, or does it? Uh, no, I think this this is really the this this is the tension, and throughout the the Hebrew Bible, we can see that God is um, is talked about in very anthropomorphic terms. Like uh, he he passes by, you can see his face. Mm. He actually speak face to face. It says in Hebrew, uh, face to face, he speaks with Moses. So I guess that that tension and the sort of uh, theological ingenuity it takes to bridge that gap between mm. this invisible, impossibly inv invisible God uh, and the, the um, praxis of worship mm. is sort of a, a, very, um, a very strong source within Judaism and has been. Mm. And also you mentioned that not to be able to mention his name, the Tetragrammaton, the Yud Heh Vav Heh, the four Hebrew letters. Uh, I mean, since since the exile in Babylonia, that name has only been said once a year on Yom Kippur by the high priest in the holy of the holiest in the temple. Mm -hmm. So, so sort of that that mystery, that constant veil, mm -hmm. uh, uh, concealing God's face and and His figure, is um, is an is a very strong impulse within Judaism. Mm -hmm. And as Ludwig Igra pointed out, it creates a sense of emptiness and that might yeah. be the purpose that you should feel a kind of longing that you it is it is a theological sort of um, idea within Judaism, Judaism Hester Panim the the concealment of the face the hiding of the face uh, but also again the Kohanite uh, blessing the priestly blessing you, you actually say that God turns his face towards you so it is this uh, doubleness that is sort of a, a tickling um, theological stance within Judaism that is always a pressure point I think Natalie, I'm already longing to have you back in the panel. <laughs> See you in, for, in a while. <laughs> Thank, Thank you. you. Mali is written on Islam. I'm trying to get my head round some very complex issues because um, Islam is very clearly uh, an aniconic tradition, um, but it's a, a tradition that operates in, in two ways. Um, clearly, the taboo against representing the deity was very, very strongly embedded in the public arts of Islam. At the same time, the Taboo on anarchism stretched beyond that. Um, no representation of holy figures or the prophets was ever permitted, or indeed of human or animal forms, was permitted in the public arts of Islam. And um, the depiction of the prophet uh, receiving revelation from the angel, which has caused a huge row 
uh, in um, Hamline University I in the States at the present time because the teacher who showed it to the class was accused of Islamophobia as she was sacked from her temporary job, was then reinstated after um, huge row and lots of academics came to, to rescue her, uh, illustrates the point that I think the um, an iconic tradition is very, very uh, strong uh, in the Muslim world. But I think the point that needs to be recognized is that this particular illustration, which was, I mean, I don't think I'm going to be expelled from um, Engelsberg for, for showing it, but it comes from a book. And the key factor I think one has to bear in mind is that the public arts in Islam, in the mosques, in schools, um, in caravanserais and so forth, uh, maintained consistently um, an, an, an iconic, was always an iconic. Whereas in the private realm of, of books, and one's talking of societies which had, where the ability to read was confined to a small minority of people. Um, it was all right, you weren't going to be uh, corrupted um, uh, if you saw it in a book, but the masses had to be protected from um, uh, idolatry if they um, uh, saw these forbidden images in, uh, in a mosque. One of the impulses behind this, I think, is the anti-idolatry um, graven image, image obviously which happens in the, comes from the second command we've had reference to. And one thought I think is that Hebrew identity in Egypt uh, was trying to protect itself, if you like, the group, the Kamian group um, feeling against the impulses of these very, very powerful images of the Pharaoh who's also a divine being. Um, and out of that tradition you get obviously the idea that you can't just um, have your own representation of the deity, you've got to um, have a, have a non-representative uh, deity. And I think um, that is part of the dynamic which um, Islam obviously inherited from its uh, Judaic predecessor, um, which produces the kind of iconoclastic um, uh, horrors that we saw recently, well, in the 1990s uh, in Afghanistan, where they blew up those amazing representations of, of, of the Buddha at Bamiyan. Um, We've had some very good discussions about uh, the representation of, of, of God in Byzantine art, and obviously uh, Christian tradition tends to be counter-anaphobic um, because uh, clearly once the God has made himself human, even though he goes back to heaven again, um, it, 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 it there'd be a sort of illogicality about having uh, a, a representation of him. Um, but I think in the discourse about um, representation, uh, one of the key uh, factors is, is how um, it was actually uh, understood uh, by the Pope that um, you you need to have pictures um, to illustrate the stories of the gospel like this great Caravaggio painting of the Supper de Mars because the illiterate masses won't understand the message, God's message, unless they have pictures to, uh, to help them. The, the people who were against iconic representation tended to often used an argument that there was the danger of what's called the substitution error. 
Prophets such as Isaiah stated that when the idolater bows down to the idol, he's worshipping the image itself rather than what it represents. Hence the prohibition against making pictures and sculptures is explained by the potential of material objects to be transformed from representation of God or gods to the actual deities themselves. And that is clearly um, part of the religious impulse that you find in the Islamic uh, narrative. Uh, when the Prophet enters Me Mecca in 630, um, a, 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 the, the common era, he um, destroys the idols. And this is a story that uh, goes down uh, ever uh, throughout Islamic history. Um, I think a key text is the famous letter which um, Pope Gregory the First, um, whose dates are 540 to 604, um, wrote to Serenus, Bishop of Marseille, where he he has been asked if it's okay to show pictures uh, to people, and um, he replies that what writing delivers to, re to readers a picture may represent, uh, may present to the unlearned, since um, in it even the ignorant can see what they ought to follow. Um, so there is a, a sort of very distinctive difference, I think, between the Christian and the Islamic approach here, because um, uh, the Christians um, would celebrate the corporeality of God and the divine um, in increasingly florid uh, representative forms, whereas Muslims can find that kind of intelligence to the pages of manuscripts which are not really uh, available to the masses. Um, and of course, at the time of the Reformation, you get uh, a clear iconoclastic momentum developing. You have someone like um, uh, Ulrich Zwingli, the uh, Swiss reformer, um, who says, painting God, the Holy Family, uh, and the saints is not only dangerous, it's a travesty, as no artist can possibly know uh, the truth. But though figural representation was challenged by Puritans on religious ground, in Western history, iconoclasm tended to be the exception rather than the rule, except at times of uh, social or political um, turmoil. An iconism in the visual and plastic arts may have roots in the substitution era, as it was sometimes termed, whereby representation of God or gods or holy people are misconceived as being the actual supernatural entities rather than mere symbols or signposts pointing in the direction of the inaccessible uh, divine. And there's a big a discussion um, by Maimonides, Maimonides, the great Jewish philosopher, who concludes that since the divine is beyond description, neither linguistic nor uh, representation in images uh, should be allowed. The problem here, of course, is that while holy texts use anthropomorphic terms such as God's hands, his eyes, and we've seen a reference to God's hands, and we saw some images too earlier, um, in theory, a picture as Pope Gregory allowed, may be interpreted metaphorically, just as the expression, the hand of God, is a metaphor of his power. So a drawing of God's hand can be seen as such, with Michelangelo's famous uh, Sistine Chapel uh, representing. Uh, the problem is that a painting is actually an object. It, it can't really necessarily be seen as metaphorical. It's not quite the same as a description uh, in a text. And I think one of the key questions that needs to be addressed here is that while language may mobilize people by instilling belief or promoting them to action, language is both immaterial and metaphorical. One word can only be understood in terms of another. And while referring to objects outside of language, it cannot be reified in the same way as art objects can. Visual or plastic representations that reproduce material or natural forms, by contrast, easily blur the distinction 
between a symbol and the thing symbolized. Such a blurring, so common in idolatry, does not occur in language, because in the latter there is no concrete object that can be endowed with some of the powers of the symbolized thing, uh, whether it's a sculpture or a painting. And I think that's a rather uh, key factor. And we, we had in the brilliant presentation of my predecessor um, accounts of Jewish anachronism, which was obviously something that developed over uh, a period of time. But it's interesting to observe that, for instance, when the young Marc Chagall, the great Russian Jewish painter, wanted to become a painter, he was told by his family that becoming a painter is not a Jewish profession. It wasn't the done thing. Um, as time is rather limited, uh, and my paper's quite, quite long, uh, I wanted to sort of move on to um, the point that both Jewish and non-Jewish painters, particularly Russians, had in fact developed autonomously without necessarily looking at Islamic influences, developed uh, a kind of theological aesthetic where they um, saw that the use of Christian iconography, uh, it starts with a famous essay that Vasily Kandinsky uh, wrote about the search for the spiritual in art. And that was actually a movement that takes us towards um, a kind of abstraction. And I think what's particularly interesting here is that on the, amongst Muslims, you have this amazing uh, development of these very, very complex um, geometrical forms of uh, surds uh, and integers, which can't always be uh, rendered uh, even in terms of pure mathematic. Uh, so you have in um, the Alhambra Palace, from which this picture comes uh, in Granada, um, a, a geometry which was, is perceived by Western observers as having mystical resonance with abstract designs of staggering complexity, uh, while the lacework decoration you will f also find in Islamic arts reflects or hint at the impermanence of all material and visible things. Um, there's a big discussion amongst the scholars as to whether, in fact, these have any kind of theological or symbolic significance. Is it something that simply comes out of a, a craft tradition that goes back to Pythagoras, to pre-modern, uh, pre-Islamic, pre-Christian, times of late antiquity, or was it something that was consciously uh, thought through and developed um, by uh, conscious uh, artists? And, and it's always been uh, my, because I was a good friend of the late Oleg Grabar, who's the most skeptical of Islamic art historians, he would say, it's only Westerners like Titus Burkhardt who sort of attributed some kind of mystical meanings to Islamic uh, uh, patterns. Um, whereas uh, elsewhere, you, uh, you've got other artists very much influenced by Western intellectual aesthetic who tend to um, find real um, significance in, in such uh, images. Uh, as time is out, I think what I would like to do is to conclude by referencing the way that, for instance, you've got a great Jewish artist like Mark Rothko, who develops an, an, an iconic aesthetic to an, uh, an extraordinary degree, um, which is very much in marked contrast to what you would find in the... Um, uh, in the Western tradition, and I just wanted to conclude by reference to one of my great heroes, Piet Mondiran, is, is <coughs> the, the Dutch painter. He actually um, really wrote a, a, a sort of um, spiritual narrative accompanying his work from 
the early Romanticism of the 1908 period, uh, which you find in early works, to this extraordinary uh, rigid structuralism, uh, which he ended his career with in New York. And one of the things that I found particularly interesting here, there's no reference to Islam or Islamic um, aesthetic in his work at all. But in fact, uh, you find that is the second, the first image is from um, City of New York, 1941. Um, the second is an 8th century tile from Iraq, uh, done in the Kufic manner. And the, the parallels I found extraordinarily compelling. Thank you very much. I have to call Nathan Sakhar up on the stage and I come back with my questions when you are a member of the panel. Okay. Thank you for the art lesson at the end. Okay. Thanks for all. I'm going to give a few glimpses from Spanish history about how Christian kings have treated conquered religions. What you see here is a remarkable testimony from medieval Europe, a time supposedly of intolerance and fanaticism. In 1252, in the Cathedral of Seville, around the tomb of the great warrior king Ferdinand III, Fernando el Santo, his eulogy was carved in four languages, Arabic, Hebrew, Latin, and Castilian. It says here that Fernando was the most God-fearing of kings, that he battled the most enemies, that he was faithful to his friends, and that he conquered Seville, the greatest city of Iberia. Ferdinand became a saint. All the hundreds of villages in Latin America called San Fernando are named after him. And in, in Spanish school books, until very recently, he was presented as the Reconquista King, a religious warrior who helped drive out Islam from the peninsula. But that's a false image of him, put together by later fanatics. In the inscription, it doesn't say that he conquered in the name of Christ or that his enemies were all Muslims. He didn't face any pressure, as our leaders do, to pose as a multiculturalist. His son, Alfonso, Alfonso the Wise, who wrote the eulogy, he used the four languages because those were the main languages of his subjects. Alfonso and Fernando called themselves king of three religions, with pride. They did not, like many others at the time, call themselves the king of the one religion or the true religion. This was a time when, when Jews were kicked out of the main European lands, England, Germany, France. In 1236, when Alfonso and Ferdinand conquered Cordoba with the, the most famous mosque in the world, the mosque wasn't raised. It was turned into a cathedral and it remains the city's main tourist attraction. You've all seen it, at least on postcard. No one calls it a church. To this day, it's called a mesquita. And in 1236, the Muslims of Cordoba were not driven away, nor were they baptized. And the other mosques in the city were left intact. This celebrated tolerance of medieval Spain flourished both in Christian kingdoms and in Muslim emirates. But not in all of them. There were other currents, crusader and jihadi attitudes, where conquered peoples were murdered as infidels or converted by the sword. The African Berber dynasties, the Muwahadun and the Murabitun, killed both infidels and Spanish Muslims when they conquered Iberia. And when the Christians took the town of Barbastro in 1064, the Muslims were murdered. But those were exceptions. Tolerance was the preferred model of rulers, even though nobody knew the word tolerance. For a king to kill or expel a law-abiding taxpayer because of his religion would have been senseless. As late as 
1492, when the last Muslim enclave, Granada, fell to the United Kingdom of Castile and Aragon, the terms guaranteed the rights of the Muslim inhabitants. They were not forced to leave and they were not forced to become Christians. But by then, Spanish pluralism was coming to an end. A few months after the Battle of Granada, the Jews of Spain were given the choice between their faith and their country. Ten years later, the Spanish Muslims were given the same ultimatum. In 1520, when Hernán Cortés conquered the Aztec capital, Tenochtitlán, today's Mexico City, non-Christians had lost their standing as legitimate Spanish subjects. Uh, Cortés, the conquistador, he wrote to the Habsburg emperor that when he saw the glory of Tenochtitlan, he could not believe his eyes. The main temple of the Mexicans, El Templo Mayor, was destroyed. The Spaniards didn't let it remain because it had been used for human sacrifice and also because it was the center of the cosmic vision of the natives. From there, the waste ran to the netherworld and to the four corners of the universe. And whoever wanted to launch a new religion in that place had to remove the cornerstone of the old one. There was also another motive, an obvious motive, envy. The Franciscan friar, Benavente, denounced the beauty of Mexican architecture. It was, he wrote, vain and arrogant, an expression of the mortal sin, superbia, vanity. But this wasn't intolerance and iconoclasm weren't sustainable models for Christian mission in the New World. The natives were dying fast from European viruses. There were few left to do any work. In Spain, you could afford to burn heretics or to expel them. In Spanish America, people were the rarest commodity. And also, before you could punish Mexicans and Peruvians for heresy, they had to understand heresy from what? Christianity, with its trinity, saints, apostles, prophets, martyrs, hell, purgatory, crucifixion and resurrection, is not something that you can teach anybody in an afternoon. The Pope, Paul IV, called for pragmatism. Jesus and Mary should be inserted into the mental universe of the natives by turning temples into churches and by pouring Christian content into the old customs and rituals. The first church, the first, here it is, the first church in Cusco, after the conquest of the Inca state, was a former temple to the creator of the world, Viracocha. And the church still stands as an annex to the, to the cathedral, here to the right. After 30 years of Spanish rule in the Andes, the church began to lose, to lose patience because the piety of the natives didn't keep up with expectations. The hardline Spanish theologians asked permission to destroy the huacas. Huacas are idols and symbols of the local religions. It's a very wide concept. A huaca could be a rock, a sculpture, site of worship, the ocean was divine, rivers were holy, and the rainbow and the falcon, and the condor and the puma were spiritual beings, and the cultivation of potatoes and corn and coca was full of sacred turns. Families had their own wakas along roads and trails. There were heaps of stones that served as altars. Stepping into a stream had meaning. And how could the few Spaniards prevent and destroy all that in a world of steep mountains and deep valleys in an area three times the size of Spain. While the Spaniards struggled with spreading Christianity, the Spanish priests were learning Quechua and Aymara in order to preach in the native languages. While the Spaniards struggled, a native counter-revolution called the Taki Onkoy broke out. It was the mystical rebellion. By fasting, prayer and dance, and by avoiding Spanish foods, wheat, beef, pork, the old native symbols would recover their force, 
baptism would be cancelled. When this was done, but only then would the time be ready for a military rising against the Spaniards. But uh, the Taki Onkoi movement was crushed. Soon after, in 1572, the lost pocket of Inca resistance in Vilcabamba was overrun and the lost Inca Tupac Amaru was hanged. In 1650, a council of bishops in Lima decreed that now Peruvians were Christians, albeit imperfect ones. But there were heresy trials um, against Indians, against natives, all the way up to the Battle of Ayacucho in 1824, the final Spanish defeat in South America. So who won? Was the religion of the Incas quashed? Not really. Are the Inca descendants now Catholics? Yes. How can that be? Well, it's been 200 years since the church lost its power of coercion. Whoever wants to pr practice old rites is free to do so. In the countryside, there's a term la religión, which means Catholicism. And there's the term la costumbre, custom, which refers to the Andean mythology and beliefs. But those two have mixed. The people of the high plains know that all gods express themselves. A mute god would be a contradiction. So Jesus and Mary and the saints speak via the oracles of tradition who throw coca leaves up in the air and study how they fall. This way the gods communicate their wishes and reveal the future. In the big cities, educated people will say Christianity was part of the colonial repression, which is true, but the feeling in the Andean countryside is not one of resentment. There's resentment towards the whites, towards the state, the rich, towards Lima, but not towards Christianity. Christianity as it is now, fused with indigenous ideas and practices, is no longer alien. This fusion began long ago, in small things and big things. An example, in the 1790s, during the last great Inca rebellion against the Spaniards, the rebel leader Gabriel Tupac Amaro was asked by his lieutenants for permission to kill the Spanish priests. And their leader replied, by no means, without priests, who will receive our confession on our deathbeds? Here's another example. This is a painting in the Cathedral of Cusco. It's an 18th century Last Supper. Christ and the Apostles look the way they usually do. But the traditional dish, the lamb, is not there. The lamb had no rich sy symbolic meanings for the natives. Their emblematic sacrificial animal was the cuy, the guinea pig, which is the main cause here. In Europe, nothing remains of the pre-Christian outlook. The old Nordic faith lived on sporadically until the 14th, 15th century, but it's no longer around. Even in Rome, with all its pagan remnants, religion has been purged of ancient content. But the ancient spiritual past is always present in Peru, Bolivia and Ecuador, even in the cities. It's not at all intact, but it's alive. Thank you. Yeah. Now, do you think this is a universal phenomenon? You can, you can sort of crush the, the symbols of religion and belief, but it, the images stay as customs and they stay in the heart of minds of, of the people and they cleverly manage to let this survive? Well, sometimes it works and sometimes it doesn't. Here in the north, it worked in the end. But uh, not long ago, we went to the famous uh, ruins of Jericho, the Omayyad Palace, and we were surprised to find lots of images in that mosque. So, 
you know, this was early on in Islam. So these these mm -hmm. people were obviously still maybe in touch with their previous culture, but uh, I guess uh, well, it's the same that goes on now in I guess in uh, totalitarian states. You know, mm -hmm. you can try to to put the lead on things and, and forbid things and. Sometimes it works and sometimes it doesn't. And in Sweden, when Christianity tried to erase the old Norse gods, they, they lived on for, for a very long time. Yeah.